Hello, friends. Let me tell you a story, okay? You know, I was sitting at the kitchen table in our small two-bedroom apartment. Roy, my husband, had just left for work. The sun was streaming through the east-facing picture window. My Bible was open to the book of Matthew. My journal was ready and my pen was in my hand. And then I glanced over at the three remaining cinnamon rolls. <laughs> yeah, from those I had baked that morning. Now, Roy had eaten two before he left for work, and I had eaten three others so far, but I really wanted all the rest. Now, before starting my time with God, I just decided to fill my stomach again. Surely God wouldn't mind. He'd want me to get this out of the way before talking with him anyway, right? So I grabbed the rolls and a Diet Coke to wash them down and started reading in Matthew 17. You know, I like reading until something catches my attention. So I read about the transfiguration, but no special ins new insights came. So I continued reading how the disciples couldn't heal a demon-possessed boy. And then the father brought him to Jesus, and Jesus healed him. So in a private conversation, the disciples asked Jesus, why couldn't we drive out the demon? It was when I read Jesus' answer to them that God's flashlight illuminated the passage and the words went straight to my heart. Jesus replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And that's Matthew 17, 20. So as thoughts kept going through my mind, I began writing in my journal. And I'm like, God, I have a little bit of faith, but I also have a mountain of flesh on my body. How can this mountain be moved? Now, to put things into perspective, it was 1977, and I weighed over 200 for the first time in my life. And I was headed towards 250. I, you know, I could see the pounds creeping up, and I didn't like it. Still, I love cinnamon rolls. Let's just be honest. And cookies and cakes and mashed potatoes and french fries and pizza and rich casseroles and hot rolls and chips and all that stuff. But the passage I was reading about was about Jesus. And he is the one who said, if I had faith, I could move a mountain. And I wanted my mountain to move. Didn't want to take the effort that it might take for it to move, but I wanted it to move. So Jesus was the one who could tell me how to get that done. Now, he didn't answer my question in an audible voice, but in that deep sense of knowing in my heart and soul. And I know the answer was straight from him because it wasn't any answer I expected, had ever heard anywhere before, or had ever thought about. So I wrote what he said in my journal. Stop eating sugar, eat more meats, fruits, and vegetables. Stop eating so much bread. This was my lifestyle plan, my lifestyle change plan, straight from Jesus. Now, I didn't have to stop and think about what I did next. I wrote my answer to him in my journal. Nice plan, Jesus. If I could do that, I could lose weight, but I can't do that. I didn't ask him if he could help me with this plan. I didn't tell him I'd think about it. I didn't decide if he was telling me to do this, then he must have a reason. I simply said, basically, I mean, I didn't say, I didn't write this, but what I meant was, I don't need your advice after all, Jesus. I didn't want to give up sugar, friends. I didn't 
think I should have to give up sugar forever. I knew the Bible well enough to know as a Christian, I'm free to do whatever I want. And if I want to eat sugar, then by golly, I'm going to eat sugar. Yeah, I'm going to do it. No one where in the Bible does it say thou shalt not eat sugar. But the conundrum I found myself in was I wanted to lose weight and I knew eating too many foods containing processed sugar was one of my biggest problems. Still, I didn't want to give up those foods completely. More emphatically, I was sure I couldn't give them up. They were too intertwined with who I was. For the next 30 years, I tried to lose weight by finding diets that curtailed sugar and most breads and focused on protein, meat, vegetables, and fruit. And on those diets, I could lose weight, but I never learned anything about how to change my lifestyle and my habits forever. I'd stay on the diet until I got to a goal. Then I'd celebrate by baking one of grandma's delicious oatmeal cakes and eating as much of it as I wanted. Doing this meant I would go off the diet, gain the weight back plus more. One bite of any concoction that contained processed flour and sugar would mean I would go back to the way that I had always been eating. The plan Jesus gave me felt like he was being mean to me. Why could I not eat sugar? Others could eat it and not gain an ounce. Life wasn't fair. But he made himself clear and plain to me on that day. And it's a day I will never forget. It's the day my loving Jesus gave me my lifestyle change plan. It was designed especially for me. But I thumbed my nose at him and walked away. Even by this time, eating sugar had become more important to me than following him. I had no clue I would become more than twice the size I was then before I finally implemented his plan. I didn't know I was already living a lie. It was a lie that affected my entire life, my body, my soul, my spirit, because my soul was made up of my mind, my will, and my emotions, and those contained my thoughts, feelings, and desires, which were all involved in helping me believe the lie that I needed sugar to survive. I had been programming my body to want more sugar. If I'd been in my right mind and thought about it logically, I would see eating sugar was not good for me. I was gaining weight, taxing my body, and setting myself up to develop diabetes, high blood pressure, and many other issues. I was denying the Holy Spirit access to all of me. I was choosing to allow a different spirit to control this area of my life. I was blinded by a lie I had allowed to grow into a stronghold because I had certainly fed it often enough. I didn't see overeating as a sin. I didn't understand damaging my physical body, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, was a sin. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 pretty much tells us that. I also didn't understand that even though I was saved, grew up in the church, attended church every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and followed all the church rules, I was still very capable of not only sinning, but allowing a stronghold of sin to take over a part of my life. Now, I'd heard a lot of sermons about alcohol, drugs, dancing, premarital sex, even the dangers of secular music, but there was never even one sermon about overeating. It was not on the list of my church's do nots. Yeah, which reminds me of the word donuts. And donuts was definitely on the church do list. They were what got me there early every Sunday morning. Free donuts. Yeah. 
When I asked Jesus how to move my mountain of weight, it wasn't because I was convicted that it was a sin. It was because I saw my weight as an inconvenience. None of my clothes fit, I didn't have money to buy new ones. Plus, I didn't want to look like a fat blob. My reasons for wanting to lose weight were purely selfish, as were my reasons for eating whatever I wanted whenever I wanted it. Now, I'm surprised Jesus even answered my very selfish prayer. He answered, though, because he had a vested interest in what I was doing to myself. He gave me the right answer. I just didn't realize the depth of the question I had asked. If I had known then what would eventually happen to me, all the difficulties, the missed opportunities, the pain and disease that I had opened the door to, maybe I would have listened to him. Sometimes, though, <laughs> the best lessons we have to learn through experiencing failures and brokenness, because those are the ones we'll never forget. See, I needed to understand what God was trying to tell me. I had asked him many times to show me why I couldn't do what he wanted me to do. And then one day I was reading uh, the Bible and a verse I had never paid attention to jumped out at me. And this is Romans 6, 6. It's in the Passion Translation. Could it be any clearer that our former identity is now and forever deprived of its power. For we were co-crucified with him to dismantle the stronghold of sin within us so that we would not continue to live one minute longer submitted to sin's power. Before we come to Christ, Satan owns us. We have to do what he says. We are in bondage to him. We have a stronghold of sin. When we become Christians, our old self dies, just like the picture baptism gives us. Our sins are buried in the water. We are raised to walk, no longer having to listen to the devil. Jesus sets us free to choose. We are not under Satan's control anymore. We can make different choices. When we come to Christ, he wipes our slate clean of the sins that we've committed. They are thrown into the deepest ocean, like Micah 7.19 says. They have, been, they have been separated from us as far as the east is from the west, like Psalm 103.12 tells us. God doesn't even remember what we've done, like Hebrews 8.12 says. Our past is in the past. We might remember, but as far as God is concerned, we're ready to start over. He declares us righteous because we have embraced and identified with his son. What has been removed from us is the obligation to sin, but the tendency or urge to sin has not been removed. Sin's power is only removed when we walk with God and receive his dynamic power. But we can be saved and still not walking with him. It's broken when we choose to follow what he says. We do this by walking in his spirit, being in constant communication with him, listening to what he says and following him in obedience. It's not going to happen automatically, friends. We must choose him, and we do that by our actions. So for any stronghold to be broken, I have to identify what that stronghold is. I can't break something undefinable. I want, went for years believing that my desire to consume sweets and high-carbohydrate-laden high foods was normal. It wasn't a sin. It was just the way I was created. But when I saw what I was doing was flagrant disobedience to God and still didn't give it up, I knew what was going on within me was bigger than just a small issue. It was deeper 
been a lie. It was a stronghold. I had constructed a prison inside me, which I continued to build every time I dieted and tried to curtail eating sugar. I could lose weight, but I always gained it back plus more when I began eating the sugar again. And then the evil one would whisper, see, you can't give up sugar. You're a failure. I was caught in a bondage, though, of my own making. The weapon against a lie is always the truth. When the truth stares me right in the face, it's really difficult to deny. And I was in the super morbidly obese category. Category. I had diabetes, high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, could barely walk, and a cardiac surgeon had given me five years to live. This was my truth, and I had to accept it, and it was a hard truth. So the truth was what I was eating was killing me. I still wasn't ready to give up sugar, though but I did go on another diet. <laughs> the stronghold was not broken though until I understood that I need to access God's power. This power was given to me by Jesus Christ because he has all authority and power. And for years I thought I didn't have a choice. I had to give in to my thoughts and my feelings and my cravings, and I thought I was powerless over them. In my humanity, I am powerless over sugar. But because I can join with Jesus, I have a secret power I had not yet learned how to use. Romans 6.11, Passion Translation tells us, since you are now joined with Jesus, you must continually view yourselves as dead and unresponsive to sin's appeal while, while living daily for God's pleasure in union with Jesus, the anointed one. My union with Christ is like a supernatural power generator just waiting for me to plug in. The way I plug into his power is not a secret. It's written in plain language in his word. It is counterintuitive, especially to the modern day culture which tells us that we are strong and we can overcome anything. We just have to put our willpower to it. God, though, doesn't work that way. He has a better plan. So when I admit to God I am weak in my human strength and surrender the area I am gripping so tightly, I finally plug into his supernatural Holy Spirit power generator called grace. When I do this, I have more than enough strength, more than enough ability, more than enough anointing, and more than enough power. Until then, the power is simply sitting there waiting for me to claim it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10 in the Amplified, it's become um, kind of my life verse, what I stand on. God has said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness and my mercy are more than enough, always available, regardless of the situation. For my power is being perfected and is completed and shows itself most effectively in your weakness. Your weakness, my weakness, that's where his power shines. Therefore, I will the more gladly boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may completely enfold me and may dwell in me. So I am well pleased with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, and with difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak in human strength, then I am strong, truly able, truly powerful, truly drawing from God's strength. When I understood it was natural for me as a human being to be weak, 
It made all the difference in the world. When I accepted my weakness, I stopped trying to cover it up by running to every diet in the world. Then I was able to choose to rest in the complete strength of Christ. This is when I could finally do all things through Christ who gives me strength, as Philippians 4.13 tells us. It's very simple and extremely difficult at the same time because we are taught to never admit our weaknesses. I've learned my human strength only lasts so long. I could give up sugar for about nine months before I had to have another hit of my drug of choice. Surrendering my will to God and allowing him to be my strength has made all the difference in the world. You know, it's only possible to break mental strongholds when we rely completely on the life-changing power of the Holy Spirit. I knew this long before I applied it to my situation. In 1975, right out of college, I was in a growing young adult group in my church in Richmond, Virginia. Bonnie was the co-leader of the group with me, and she taught us many melodies set to scripture, but there was one I really loved. And when both of my children was, were born, it was the song I used as a lullaby. I wanted to make a lasting impression on them, that God is their help and strength. If we truly surrender to his leading, he guides us in ways we could never imagine, guess, or request in our wildest dreams. He's not bossy or pushy about what he knows is the best for us. He just works in gentle ways with, with us, showing us the truth of his Holy Spirit working deeply within us. The song that I mentioned was from Psalms 121, and it's in the King James Version. The words are for everyone who longs to, to, for God to help them break free of the strongholds which has them bound. There is power and truth in these words. Our strength comes from God and him alone. It's not something we conjure up on our own. It's a person we submit to completely. So this is based on Psalm 121, and I might try to sing it. I don't know if I can do it or not, but I'll try. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not suffer my foot to be moved. He that keepeth me will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is my keeper. The Lord is my shade upon my right hand. The sun shall not smite me by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve me from all evil. He shall preserve my soul. Behold, he shall preserve my going out and my coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. So you can see why I'm not a, <laughs> why I'm not, why I wasn't a music major, right? But that's just to show you that those words really impacted me. And I, I've been able to memorize that and hold that in my heart because God and God alone is my strength. When I follow him, I can do anything because he is giving me the power. I gave up foods with processed sugar and gluten. It didn't happen overnight. It was a process of habit change, like I've talked about before on this podcast, and that resulted in a total lifestyle change, body, soul, and spirit. But the strongholds hold, which says, I'm not strong enough to give up sugar, has been broken in Jesus' name, and all praise and honor and glory go only to God. He is where my strength comes from. He is where your strength comes from. He is who we all have to draw on to do these kinds of things that seem 
impossible. So let's pray. Oh God, we know we can't lose weight on our own and keep it off. We can't give up sugar on our own. We can't break entrenched strongholds on our own. Only you can help us do all of those things. Thank you, God, that you are where our strength comes from. Show us what to do and give us the strength to do it. In Jesus' name. Friends, I am rooting for you. Feel free to join us in Overcomers Academy so I can give you some more tips and advice and help you on your journey. And you can join with others on the journey with you. Go to TeresaShieldsParker.com backslash overcomers. That link and the link for Sweet Surrender will be down in the show notes. Until next week, friends, sweet grace for your journey.